Lord, we thank you and praise you for the message this morning. I ask, Lord, that you would touch my lips with a coal from the altar in heaven, Lord. Yes. To speak words that you would have me to speak, Lord, not mine. Open our hearts, God, to receive what you have for us today. I ask this, Jesus, in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. My message is titled, Is the Bible the Truth? Now, Mark answered that for you earlier, so we could all just pack up and go home. Yes, it is. But we're going to look at that a little bit because today that's being questioned quite a bit. People saying the Bible is, is not true. Even that whole idea of truth, people are confused about what is truth. How do we know what truth is? We're going to take a look at that as well. Now, this. I've spoken on a lot of this a couple of years ago, but I think every few years we need to be reminded that the book we call the Bible is the ultimate truth. It's God's Word given to man. All other truth should be filtered through the Bible. If it doesn't line up, it's not truth. This is truth. It doesn't matter how old it is. In fact, the age of the Bible and the fact we still have it is one of the things that tells us that it's from God. It's lasted through history. God has protected it. So we're going to take a look at that this morning. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Speaking of God's word, God's word is truth. And some say, well, you know, the real truth is the red letters in the Bible. I mean, you still have one of those red letter Bibles. Yes. Where all the words of Jesus are in red. Well, they, they just put them in red. In the original manuscripts, when really written, they didn't write with a red pen, some of the words. That was just done to help you identify the actual words that Jesus spoke. But that doesn't mean that the red was more truth than the part that wasn't in red. Yes. But somehow, some people think that that's what that means. That you only focus on the red words as the real truth, the rest of it just kind of, you know, helps put the story around it. No, that's all truth. His word, God's word, is truth. What is truth? That which is true in accordance with fact or reality. Truth should be based, backed up by fact or reality. Today we have a lot of truth that people are looking at that isn't backed by anything of their own ideas. It's not backed by fact. It's not backed by the reality. It's backed by what they want truth to be. That's not truth. There's this thing called relative truth. That's the biggest problem today as we have taught whole generations of this idea of relative truth. I heard a story. I read a story. Mom, she was driving along and her two kids her oldest daughter and her younger son, they were getting in an argument. They saw a bird that they had passed by on the road. The daughter was saying, that bird was black and red. And the boy was saying, no, that bird was black and red and yellow. And they were arguing back and forth. And the mom, to silence them, said, you're both right. Everybody has their own truth. So you can both be right. Well, that came back to bite her the next day because the two got in a fight. The older sister slugged the younger brother. And he came and told the mom, Mom, sis hit me. And she came in the room and she said, Did you hit your brother? She said, No. And he said, Yes, yes, she did. He said, and she said, Well, everybody has their own truth. <laughs> That's not my truth. Uh -huh. the problem, isn't it? Relative truth is like that. <laughs> you think that you can just decide what your truth is and it's not somebody else's truth is different. Doesn't work, does it? Some people say, that's not my truth. Everyone has to decide what's true for them. Ever heard that? That's relative truth. That's true for you, but it's not for me. How can something be true for one person, but not to? See, that's not really truth, is it? Who are you to tell me what's true or not? Truth is relative. There are no absolute truths. We hear that kind of stuff all the time now. There is an absolute truth. It's God's Word. And somebody said this to me recently. 
We live in 2019. Life evolves. Tolerance is love. Separation is evil. Not all of the Bible are today's truths. Well, sorry, but that's not true. The Bible is still today's truth. But some people think, well, it's 2019. We don't believe that book anymore, so it's no longer true. Well, just because somebody chooses not to believe it doesn't mean it's no longer true. A little short clip here of somebody else's take on what we believe. A couple of things I want to say. I've been on this planet for 68 years. Over half of the cumulative knowledge of mankind has been acquired during my lifetime. A lot of these people choose to believe millennium-old dogma that's been proven wrong. See, we just believe millennium-old dogma that's been proven wrong. Has it been proven wrong? No. That's okay. My wife said you should, but that's this is a public document. This is not a private video. Mm -hmm. It's online. It's public. That was from a a meeting where people were arguing that my truth is somehow wrong. But just the fact that it's millennials old doesn't mean it's no longer true. What we believe is still true because we believe God's Word. And God's Word is truth. According to Josh McDowell, when Christians were asked in 2011 if there is such a thing as absolute truth, 91% said there is no absolute truth apart from myself. That's frightening. And I'm telling you, it hasn't gotten better since 2011. 91% of Christians think that there is no absolute truth. Have they not heard of the book that they base their faith on? The Bible is absolute truth. When we move away from this idea that the Bible is absolute truth, then what do we base our faith on? We might as well just throw it away. Why do we study it? It's still absolute truth. But today, somehow people think because we live in the age we live in that we're smarter than God and that we can now determine what's true and what's not true and throw out what we don't like out of His Word that just doesn't work. Absolute truth means that it is independently true for all people, even if they do not know it or recognize it to be true. The Bible is absolute truth, and it's independently true of all people. We don't determine whether or not it's true. It's true. Even if we don't recognize it as truth, God's Word is truth. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We're not adequate, we're not equipped for anything if Scripture is not inspired by God. But 2 Timothy tells all Scripture is inspired by God. All of it, the Old and the New Testament, all is inspired by God. It was given to us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit through men. We were talking about that this morning in Sunday school. It's interesting that some of the books of other world religions were given by angels, not by the Holy Spirit. And Galatians, was it Galatians? I give you the verse. I think it was Galatians 1.8 warns us that if we hear some other gospel, even if it's from an angel, it's a curse. We were warned about that, yet there are some major world religions whose books were given to them by angels, not by the Holy Spirit. The Bible was given by the inspiration of God, by the Holy Spirit, to men to write it down. It's also interesting that in 2 Peter we find that even when Peter wrote this, they had already begun to look at some of the writings of Paul as equivalent to Scripture. Says, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand which untaught, unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the Scriptures. 
He was saying Paul's writings were equivalent to the rest of the scriptures. They were already recognizing that it was inspired by God very early on, before they came together with the writings that they put together as the New Testament. So how do we know that what we have today is reliable? How do we know the Bible we have today that we can trust it, that these are actually the words that were inspired by God and given to men? One of the ways is we have the manuscript evidence. We have evidence that shows us that these came from very early writings, what we know as the Bible today. Today there survives more than 25,000 partial and complete ancient handwritten manuscript copies of the New Testament, as well as thousands of copies of the Old Testament, many of them predating the time of Christ. That's a lot of manuscript evidence. There are some ancient writings that they teach in schools, they take as truth, that they've only got one or two copies of. But we have 25,000 partial and complete copies of the New Testament alone, and then thousands of copies of the Old Testament. And when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls were written before the time of Christ, and they lined up perfectly what we knew today as the Old Testament. Very old manuscript evidence, more, more so than any other historic book. God has preserved it so that we would have it today, the way it was given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit for men to write down. Matthew 5, 18-19 says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. What Jesus was saying there is that it's going to last. It's not going to pass away. He's also saying it didn't change. Not one of the smallest letters, which is the Yod in Hebrew, or the smallest stroke, the little, some of the letters, it's just one little mark on them that deciphers one letter from that. He said that didn't change. It stayed. We have that. We, we know today that God's Word has not changed. Another way we know that the Bible is true is fulfilled prophecy. Is that important? Well, yes it is, because there's a lot of books that contain things claim to be prophetic in the world, but yet the prophecies never came true. The Bible is different. It has a history of fulfilling prophecy. And that's one of the ways we know it is from God. How else can you write down words, sometimes thousand years before they came about, that this is going to happen and it happens the way it was written down. It has to come from somebody who lives outside of time. It had to have come from God. In the words of Chuck Misler, he said, the Bible has the audacity to hang its credibility and authenticity on its record of recording history before it happens. That's what prophecy is. Recording history before it happens. We don't take prophecy seriously because it is in the Bible. We take the Bible seriously because of the track record of its prophecies. The Bible is unique in that it contains specific prophecies about future events, many that have yet to be fulfilled. According to the Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy, there are 1,239 prophecies in the Old Testament, 578 prophecies in the New Testament, for a total of 1,817 prophecies in the Bible. That's History written before it happened. These prophecies are contained in 8,352 of the 8,352 verses that contain prophecies constitute 26.8% of the Bible's volume. So 26%, that's more than a quarter of the Bible, is prophecy. So it's important. Helps us to know that it came from God. There are over 300 of these that specify with precision centuries in advance the details of Jesus' genealogy, his birth, his ministry, and his sacrificial death that are recorded in the documents that make up the New Testament. No other book in the world can place its truth on its record of prophetic prediction. So think about that. 300 verses that predicted that Jesus would come, he would be born, what his ministry would be, and that he would have a sacrificial death. 
in the Bible? Were they fulfilled? Or were they just, you know, things jotted down in the Old Testament? They say for just eight of the 300 prophecies to be fulfilled by a single person is conservatively calculated at 1 in 10 to the 28th power. That means one chance in 10 with 28 zeros behind. Don't even know what you'd call that number. That's just for eight of the prophecies to be fulfilled. He fulfilled most of them. Some of them were of his second coming. But all the prophecies of his first coming were fulfilled. For 48 of the 300, and even more than 48 have been fulfilled, it would be one in a 10 with 157 zeros behind it. There are only 10 to the 77th power to 10 to the 80th power atoms in the universe. Mm -hmm. To kind of, just to give you that. That means one and far more than twice the number of atoms in the universe. Chance that somebody could fulfill 48 of those prophecies. Jesus fulfilled more than 48 of them. In other words, it's impossible that a book could predict with that kind of accuracy mm -hmm. unless it came from a divine source, came from God. I know those are big numbers and they just can make your head explode, but sometimes we need to let our head explode a little, realize that God is so big that He can give us history in advance. Then there's archaeological evidence. A lot of people say, well, science has disproved the Bible. There's no proof. For a long time they said that there was all these different countries that were spoken of in the Bible never existed. They said that there was never a city of Jericho. They said that there was never a city of David. The King David never existed. It was all just stories that they put in the Bible. Well, praise God for archaeologists who like to dig around in the dirt and dig things up. My wife said she had always felt like she'd like to do that. Go and dig and find history in the ground. Well, they keep finding things that prove the Bible. Things that they said weren't true. Archaeology confirms 50 real people in the Bible. They've already confirmed that 50 people that the Bible speaks about really existed. Because they found their names, they found writings about them. One of them, its recent discovery, was Caiaphas, his ossuary. An ossuary or bone box, when they would... Put somebody, when somebody died, they'd put them in the tomb and they'd lay on that slab in the tomb until their body disintegrated and nothing was left but bones. And then they would put their bones into a box. And that was stored in the tomb so that tomb could be used over and over by the family. But they kept the bones because they believed in the resurrection. So they kept them in a box. Well, written on the side of that box was the name of Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, there are many scholars for a long time said there was no Caiaphas. There's no historical evidence that Caiaphas ever existed. The Bible just made up that name. Well, they found his bones. If his bones are in a box, he must have existed. There was another ossuary that was found. They're still studying it to try to, to determine whether it's a, a forgery or fact, but it had the name of James, the brother of Jesus on which is unusual because normally they would put James the son of and they put the father's name. But they said the fact that it said James brother of Jesus meant that the Jesus it was speaking about had to have been somebody really important and really well known and they believed that the box could only be the bones of James, his brother that wrote the book of James in the Bible. They also said Pontius Pilate never existed. He said, no record in Roman history that there ever was a Pontius Pilate. Well, until they dug up this stone and it had a dedication to Pontius Pilate on the stone. Oh, wait a second. There really was a Pontius Pilate. So the more they dig and look, the more they find things that prove the Bible. It hasn't been disproven. So don't believe that when you hear it. Another thing they found that they said there were, they didn't believe there really was a King David. A long time, that's what historians taught. There was no King David. The Jewish people made that up, you know, to go along with their star of David. They all said it from David. There was no King David. Well, they found a stone that said the house of David, referring to the king. And now they have found in Israel 
the foundation of the city of David and of David's palace. That they claim didn't exist. They've now found it. You know where they found it? This archaeologist got this brilliant idea. I'm going to look in the Bible and see where it says the city of David was and where David's palace was. And he calculated it based on what the Bible said. And guess what? He dug in that spot and he found it. Imagine that. The most successful archaeologists in Israel are the ones that look at the Bible and it says this city or this place existed in this particular spot. They go to that spot and they look for it and there it is. So they say, well, maybe we ought to pay more attention to the Bible instead of thinking that it was wrong and we're trying to prove it wrong. Maybe we should go the other way. And they're discovering all kinds of things that prove that the Bible is correct. This is a, the Nabonidus cylinder, King Nabonidus of Babylon, left a cuneiform cylinder mentioning his elder son Belshazzar by name. That was another one. They said there never was a Belshazzar. Remember the story of Belshazzar and the hand of God wrote on the wall? And they tried to say there never was a Belshazzar. That's just a made-up story. Well, lo and behold, they find this cylinder with the records of the king naming his older son Belshazzar. He did exist. Constantly, this is what they're finding. When they really look, they find that the Bible is true. So what about the internal consistency of a Bible, the Bible? That's another way we know that this is truth. Now, I just hope you're all soaking this in so next time somebody tells you don't trust the Bible, you won't listen to that. Because you watch the History Channel and they got all these scholars on there, you know, these are learned men from this university and they tell you, oh, that's not really what it said. That's not really what happened. We don't really believe that. They're a bunch of fools. I hear that all the time on supposed science channels and history channels. They always go find the most liberal scholars they can that don't believe the Bible. They put them up and they get their degree. And you think these guys really know what they're talking about. They really don't. The Bible knows what it's talking about. The Bible is a collection of 66 different documents by approximately 40 different authors. Think about that. This is a book that wasn't written by one person. It's a collection of documents from 40 different authors. Many of the Bible's authors came from different educational and cultural backgrounds. Like Amos, we were reading about Amos in Sunday school. He was a sheep herder. Some of them sheep herders, some of them priests, some of them prophets. Some of disciples of Jesus. They're all from different backgrounds. Remember, Jesus' disciples were most of them were fishermen that wrote all this stuff down. It says the Bible was written over a period of approximately 1,500 years. That's a long time to write a book. Written by all these different authors, but compiled together. It says many of the authors were separated by hundreds of miles of geog of geographically. The Bible was written in Three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. They didn't even all write in the same language. The Bible addresses life's most controversial questions. So how in the world can you put together a book like that that makes any sense? Only God can do that. But yet, in spite of all these factors, the Bible is a perfectly harmonious, consistent account of how God is seeking to reconcile sinners back into relationship with himself. The consistency of the Bible is one of the proofs that it's God's Word. There's what they call a scarlet thread that runs through the Scripture. I taught on that one time. That throughout the Scriptures, you find Jesus from Genesis to Revelation throughout the Scripture. And I used to have up here a list of Jesus in all the books. That you find Him in every single book. We just don't often look for Him. But the message of salvation started in Genesis and it goes through the entire Bible until it's fulfilled. How do you get 40 different authors that speak three different languages spread out over 1,500 years to write a book that has that consistency in it? You can't. It's impossible. Kind of like that game we played in school where we called called telephone where you'd whisper a message in the first person's ear and everybody would whisper down the line and the last person would say what the message was and it never was anything close to what it started with. That's what happened when a bunch of different people tried to pass a message along. Only God 
can give us that consistent a message. The Bible is the truth. Then there's extra biblical writings. They say, well, if the Bible, if all these people were historically true, if all these things happen, how come it's not written about anywhere outside of the Bible? Well, it is. I've heard scholars say that's not recorded anywhere else, so it can't be true. Well, that's because they ignore where it's recorded outside the Bible. There's this uh, historian, Josephus, you may have heard of. Josephus was a Jewish historian that lived around the time of Christ and after the time of Christ. And he wrote a book called Antiquities of the Jews. And in his book of Antiquities, he refers to John the Baptist. It says, John, that was called the Baptist, was a good man and commanded the Jews to exercise virtue both as to righteousness towards one another and piety towards God, and so to come to baptism. <coughs> Herod, who feared the great influence John had over the people, sent John a prisoner out of Herod's suspicious temper to Macrius, the castle. He says, and I before mentioned and was there put to death. So he speaks of John the Baptist and his death by Herod and his imprisonment in the antiquities of the Jews. This is not in the Bible. This is by a historian. And Josephus was considered in his day a great historian. Now they found surviving in, a, in an Arabic manuscript of Antiquity of the Jews. It's interesting how this got bumped out of the Antiquities of the Jews that we can get a copy of today that it mentioned Jesus. But this is found in an Arabic manuscript, a portion that had been left out. It says, At this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified to die, and those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. From the Antiquities of the Jews, chapter 18, from a surviving manuscript in Arabic, in the Arabic language. So there is extra biblical writings about two major people in the New Testament. Josephus mentions more than a dozen individuals talked about in the Bible, including Herod the Great, Caiaphas, Pontius Pilate, James, the brother of Jesus, Felix, Festus, and even Jesus. Those are writings outside the Bible that confirm what the Bible says. There are biblical stories that are corroborated by other historical sources outside the Bible. The stories of the flood. Every sing, did you know that every single people group around the world, ancient people, has a story of the flood. Long lifespans prior to the flood is mentioned in, in all kinds of ancient writings. Details surrounding the exodus of the Jews, the Assyrian invasion of Israel, Nebuchadnezzar's invasion of Judah, Cyrus free, freeing of the Jews from Babylon, the prolonged darkness on the day Jesus died, Herod Agrippa's sudden death after being hailed as a god, and the expulsion of the Jews from Rome. Those are all written about in sources outside of the Bible. So anybody tells you there's no writings, historical writings that correspond to the Bible, it's just not true. But yet, I still hear it watching programs about the history of the Bible. They'll say, well, this is, you can't prove this because it's not written. There are lots of writings that correspond. They just seem to ignore those. And then it has its scientific accuracy. You know, the Bible is not a scientific book. It's not meant to be scientific, but yet it mentions a lot of things that they didn't, couldn't possibly have known, supposedly, before they were discovered by science. But yet, the Bible had already talked about it. A man named Herbert Spencer gave the world five scientific principles by which man may study the unknown. So he said, these are the principles. If you want to study the unknown, you have to study it by time, force, energy, space, and matter. Moses, by inspiration, gave us those scientific principles in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, time, God, force, created energy, the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. 
All of Spencer's scientific principles are right there in Genesis 1-1. If you just read the Bible, <laughs> come up with them even sooner. It's in the Bible. Just quickly, in astronomy, the Bible says stars are innumerable. Stars differ in glory, I mean they're different sizes, different brightnesses. Stars follow a predictable pattern. The earth is round, not flat. The earth hangs on nothing. This is all mentioned in the Bible and has been proven by astronomy. Geology says water cycles, mentioned in Ecclesiastes 1 7, Isaiah 55 10, the sea currents in Psalm 8 8, and the fountains of the deep broken up in Genesis 7 11. The interesting thing about the sea currents, it was actually the currents in the ocean were discovered by an animal who was reading the Bible and he read Psalm 8 8, and it talks about the currents in the ocean. He says, Well, there must be channels in the ocean, because the Bible says there's channels in the ocean. So they went and looked and found out that there are these currents in the ocean that they could navigate on that flow different directions, just like the Bible said. That's how they discovered the ocean currents, is because of somebody reading the Bible. And in biology, we learn about blood circulation in Leviticus 17.11, all before these things were discovered by science mentioned in the Bible, and there are many more. The other thing that proves the Bible as truth is the Bible's openness about its authors and characters' failures. Most ancient books written around the time that most of the Bible was written, when they would write about somebody, they didn't talk about their character failures and their flaws. Read the people in the Bible, they all had flaws, they all had character failures, they all failed, they all did things that were wrong. Yet it was all written down no matter how embarrassing it was. When you go back to the Babylonian writings about the kings, it talks about their triumphs and all these great things they did. A lot of it's exaggerated, it doesn't tell you anything that they ever did wrong. Because people didn't write down that stuff. But the Bible has it, that's one of the ways we know that this book is different than any other ancient writing. Because it didn't try to falsely build up the people in the Bible. It showed them for who they were. And how God intervened in their lives. Can you trust the Bible? Amen. Yes, you can. The Bible is where you find absolute truth. An example of absolute truth in the Bible is Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's an absolute truth. What does that tell you? He is the only way to the Father. See, relative truth is trying to say there are many ways. Well, that's your truth, not my truth. You know, I think I can get to heaven just by staring at the wrinkles on my knuckles. If I stare at them long enough, they're going to lead me to heaven. <laughs> I can believe that all I want, but that's not the absolute truth. Amen. There is only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. You can trust the Bible. I know I'm probably head swimming a little with all the stuff I threw at you, but I, I hope it is swimming a little. Because the Bible is like no other book. You can trust it. Why is it collecting dust in most homes? Because we've bought into the lie that it's this old, ancient book that has no relevance to us today. And I hope none of you have dust on your Bibles. I hope the pages are worn out. Marked up. You're reading it. You're studying it. That's why we're going through the what's called the minor prophets. And when we started our study on that, I said that somebody called those the clean pages in the Bible. How many people read Obadiah <coughs> or Habakkuk? <laughs> Those pages usually aren't that as marked up as the other, but you know what? We're finding out there's a lot of good stuff in those books. We need to go through it. And we have the Holy Spirit to help us to understand it. You might be looking and say, but Pastor Trent, I, I read it, I don't understand it. Did you ask the Holy Spirit to help you before you start reading it? It's amazing what will jump off the page at you when you do that. You can be reading in the book of Numbers. How many of you ever tried to get to Numbers? Begat, begat, begat. 
You can ask the Holy Spirit to, to speak to you through that. You can be reading through the book of Numbers. Something will jump out at you. I've had it happen to me. All of a sudden, you'll see something and you go, I never saw that. <coughs> wow. Because God's Word is alive. It's the absolute truth. Value it above all other books. I read a lot of books, but I don't value them like God's Word. As I read them, if anything doesn't sound right, I immediately go to God's Word and compare what they're saying compared to what the Word. I'm one of these. It takes me a while to get through some books because they'll say da 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 and this is according to, and it gives a bunch of scriptures. But it doesn't list the scriptures. So I take the time, flip over to my Bible, read those scriptures, and see, does it really say what that person just said it says? See, we always should filter everything through God's Word. It's the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but I, Him. We need to trust His Word. We need to trust His Word. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Have you trusted His words in your life? There is no other way. I don't care what the world says. I don't care if it's 2019, 2119, 2219, doesn't matter what year it is, or 1919. It means nothing to say, well, this, we live in this age and this time, therefore God's word is no longer relevant. That's just not true. God's word is as relevant today for your life as it was when it was written down. You have not accepted Christ as your Savior. That is your only way to heaven. There is no other way. If anybody has not done that, you need to do that today. Without looking around, just slip your hands up. Tell God, I need to touch my life. There's any of you here that say, you know what, I've struggled with reading God's Word. My attention has been drawn away from it to so many other things that I need to get back into it. If that's you, just without looking around, slip up your hand. I want to pray that God will give you a hunger for His Word. Thank you for your honesty. Heavenly Father, I thank You and I praise You so much. Your Word is life to us. Give us a hunger for Your Word. That we wake up in the morning and the first thing we think about is, is consuming your word, even before we consume our breakfast, Lord. Let us be so hungry for your word that we pick it up three times a day, just like we pick up a fork three times a day and study it. Make us a people of your word, God, that we would know it inside and out. So when the world throws lies at us, we know that it's a lie. We can only know the truth if we've made the truth part of our life. Help us to make your truth part of our life, Lord, I pray. I ask that, Jesus, in your wonderful and your precious name.